Um, yeah, a little bit about me. I mean, obviously, I, I come in. I hope what I talk about is interesting and value. Um, I don't know exactly what to focus on here, so you might throw out questions and answers. I have kind of a flow and an agenda, but uh, Mark said a little bit about me, and, and that pretty much covers right in here. I did go to school here. Um, honestly, this is a far better school than any of the other surrounding ones, by the way. Always loved it, even back when it was uh, UTC. Uh, played a little ball here, and that was a lot of fun. Um, Mark gave me a few different ideas to talk about. Obviously, as we talk about Kickstarter, uh, that's one that uh, might be interesting to go over. Uh, Kickstarter is a very interesting platform to me. It's a ve very millennial way of thought. So this room represents why Kickstarter could actually give birth. Um, it's not the way that I grew up thinking. It's not the way that I was trained or taught or learned. And, and as it emerged into a viable platform, it's really the mentality and the thought patterns of the millennial group that, that really make it flourish. In fact, as we we're marketing it hard, my traditional crowd and my traditional name list really struggled with understanding it. They hit a lot of barriers. They didn't understand what it was. Are they getting a product? What's a pledge? What the heck's a backer? And, and how many are familiar to some degree with Kickstarter? I'd imagine a, a good portion. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why the power of Kickstarter is, is such a new and relevant thing. Um, and go through a couple of things. Uh, entrepreneurship is a big deal. Mark mentioned maybe talk about the production cycles, the development cycles, what you have to dig into there. And that's kind of boring stuff, and I can go there and it's relevant, but if I dive too deep into that, just say, talk about something more interesting. But if that really is where you're at and interested in the technical aspects of design engineering and how to go find the solutions there, we, we can go that direction a little bit as well. Uh, nuts and bolts to a startup, the devil is in the details every time, anywhere. And there are a lot of pitfall traps and trolls. Um, there's a lot of mind game with starting up your own thing. How, how many here have started up something, an idea, a product? Maybe not formed it into a business, but maybe formed it into a business. There's probably going to be some hands. Or how many have thought about it? How many want to do it? So we're, we're talking to the right crowd. This is where, in my passion, and obviously business starts, it's not about the big ones necessarily. Those are the one in a million. You hear about the one in a million. We'll talk about that a little bit. But it's in the desires to create. And we have the total freedom to create. And, and that's, that's America. That's our culture. That's the laws that surround us. It gives everybody an equal playing field. A little bit of funding uh, as far as the food chain that goes to finding money to start up. That's something we can talk about in, in, in Q&A. But this is, uh, I find this extremely, you might have seen this graphic before. This is 100% accurate. <laughs> Behind the easy stuff that you see, hey, that made a billion dollar hit or this one did that, it's never a straight line, ever. You go through every, this is where my wife comes in. You know, if she had her hands on the steering wheel, we would have made it from LA to New York in that straight line. At least she thinks so. But no. Um, I went through every state. I went through Canada. I went through Mexico. I drove through every single state to get on uh, where, I, where I finally feel like I, I got on top of it. But that, that's really what um, you probably encountered this already, and you will encounter it if you uh, continue to go forward. But uh, the wonderful thing about Kickstarter is it really is a product, or it's proof without product. Um, you can fashion a good video around an idea and see if it's relevant. Uh, you can fashion a product or a prototype and see if the market likes it. And you can test and pulse that. And I think that's, uh, that's something that's extremely powerful. But everything from uh, who's heard of potato salad? Who, can, who, who backs potato salad? Nobody? I didn't either. Um, $55,000 for figuring out a recipe for potato salad. That's the craziness of the platform. Now, there's been a lot of attempts. No, that, he burned that one up. It's like a pet rock. You can't do another one. So you can find one. If you find a nugget like that, play around, make it fun, go for it. That's not a bad potato salad, but that's kind of, 65% of all Kickstarter campaigns don't make it. They don't fund, and most of them are 10,000 or less. Ours, I would say, obviously is a great, um, from ground zero success, I'll take it. You know, hitting 107,000 isn't, uh, isn't chump, of course, but 
that was that was crazy. That that was a lot of work that I wasn't expecting, even though I prepared and planned for months. But obviously, we we did it. It was uh, we got a lot of value from it, and uh, definitely um, don't know if I'd do it again. But you got to be grateful for it. And then you have these kind of things. You know, this guy's been out for months. Um, 30 or 3.7 million for a bag. What people don't kind of realize is you have to market this yourself. You don't just put and post. You, you can start up a, a, a Kickstarter campaign in a few minutes if you wanted to and say submit and they may approve it. If you have no crowd to bring to it, if you have no marketing, if you have no previous momentum, it's, it's not going to do anything. Kickstarter doesn't market for you. If you show up on the radar, they start acknowledging that and giving you better placement. But popularity is a big deal. But somebody like this, you know, here's a business coming in at Peak Design, having already products in play, a massive database of names. And of course, you see that and you go, wow, you know, this wasn't their first rodeo. And most of the ones that absolutely knock it out of the park, aren't, it's not their first rodeo. You also don't know how much they spend on marketing. And that's a budget item that you have to do. I spend out of 107,000, I probably spend about $6,000 on marketing. So if you look and knock it down and you take, you take Kickstarter's percentage and you take Visa, MasterCard, you take what it takes to put it there, you take what it costs to do the video, you take what it costs to kind of hire a squad around it if you do that. And then in my case, I got to deliver a product that has a cost of goods. That, that's gone very quickly. It takes a lot more than $100,000 generally to, re, uh, to launch a hard goods product. Um, so, you know, this is a huge part of it and um, not dependent upon it entirely, so that's nice. But uh, anyway, any questions on Kickstarter might be relevant? Yeah? How does it kind of start, like, what's their fees and stuff that they take out? They take 5% of successful campaigns. Yeah. Um, and here's the difference. If you, Indiegogo has the option that you can fund no matter what you get. I don't like it. People go, well, why can't you take it, you know, why doesn't Kickstarter give you the money that's raised even if you don't hit your goal? Because the goal's arbitrary. I chose $50,000 for my goal based upon some calculations. Um, the point of Kickstarter is to give you funds to deliver what you promise. So if I got $5,000 for this and I took $5,000 from people that I can't now deliver a product, you know, that, that, that doesn't just look bad. It, it doesn't vibe. It's not, in, not integrous. So, um, they take 5%, merchant fees are another 3 to 4%. Indiegogo is about the same, and, uh, but if you, <laughs> the other thing is if you opt to not, or if you opt to get whatever you raise regardless of the goal, they take a higher percentage of that. I'm not sure what it is, but it's a little bit counterintuitive to me. But I'd rather, if I'm a, back, if I'm a backer, I want to make sure I get what they're promising me. It's not a pre-order. This is not a pre-order product, even though that's kind of or, or Kickstarter is not a shopping cart. They'll, they'll tell you that. It is where I'm giving money to somebody's idea to help them develop that idea, and they're going to give me a reward in return. But I still expect it. You know, I just don't want to toss my money at, at them and go, hey, th you know, thanks for nothing. One of the big differences between Kickstarter and Indiegogo, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm remembering correctly if it's Indiegogo or something else. I think there's a third one out there as well. Um, but one of them, uh, gives legal rights to donators. Kickstarter does not. Donations are exactly that, donations of, of right. goodwill. I think, is it Indiegogo that does that? There's some kind of legal repercussion if you don't like develop a product and deliver a product? Um, I'm not sure if Indiegogo, there might be some. I think there's you know, yeah. more than a black eye, the legal repercussions, I'm not sure. It's I, not like stock, but it's something along no. those lines. You've got to deliver, right. with one of them, you've got to deliver something that people donate. Other than declaring bankruptcy and getting out of it. I mean, there's always that card that is not desirable, but I, I imagine that, I, I'm not sure. I didn't go into any of the other ones deep enough to research that. Um, just different terminology, maybe. And there are a lot of crowdfunding sites, and they have different purposes. You know, GoFundMe is more for causes. Choosing between Indiegogo and Kickstarter, in hindsight, I kind of think I might have done Indiegogo. Um, they market a little bit more for you, I think. They do a little bit more proactive nature, but, and they're big. They're, it's like Coke and Pepsi. You know, you know Coke wins, but Pepsi's better, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Is to me. I, um, crowdfunding clarification. You'll hear crowdfunding. Just real quick. Um, crowdfunding, I wish they'd call it different. They, there, there's two forms of crowdfunding. One is for securities or equity. 
and they call it crowdfunding. Then they say Kickstarter for donations, crowdfunding. And I w they need to separate those words because one is locked into legal and SEC stuff and law and all sorts of craziness when you're, when you're giving away or they're investing in your company and they have shares or units or whatever they call them. That's a totally different game. And you'll see, hey, there's a crowdfunding site for that and a crowdfunding for this, but it, it, it's completely different. This is about free and clear donations and rewards, right? Um, the tax implications just go, you got to declare it as income. You know, it's very simple and clean cut. But some people get hung up on that or they'll argue the difference and it's like it's two different things, it doesn't matter. Um, we talked about a little bit of that. The one thing about Kickstarter, it's very congested. Obviously, as it succeeds, more and more people flock to it. So it's getting big. It's getting to where I always, I, I think marketing a product is, is if you've ever been to like City Creek lunch hour at the food court, that's what it's like. And you stand up on tables and you scream and yell to be heard. You try to get attention. And that's what I felt kind of Kickstarter turned into for me or any marketing whatsoever. We're bombarded with messages. Everybody wants us to click on them, give our money to them. And that's no different. And it's getting more and more. Um, just running Kickstarter isn't necessarily, you know, it's a little bit old. The media doesn't care anymore. The, the media wants to see these, those big ones. But um, in general, that's one of the battles. You go out and try to get press releases and you try to get write-ups and bloggers to talk about you and they're going whatever, you know. We've heard it and we get asked that 10 times a day. So you gotta fight against that a lot more. Um, we talked about those other things. So you gotta kinda have to carefully go into it to deliver what you're doing. But any other questions on that? So in essence, I think everybody here probably inside of them has a killer idea. There's no doubt, there's too much creativity here. Something that would, good, would do good as an idea, it starts with that inception. But um, I'm here to tell you that an idea is worth about two to 5%, maybe even less. If I have a great idea and you go, oh, I could have done that. You know, Shia LaBeouf, right? <laughs> Just go do it. Um, it takes a lot more. The idea is easy. Uh, in a lot of ways and you can think up and dream up some good stuff but I, I have people come and say hey I have an idea if you want to do it I say if I want to do it you get two percent of the company because that's it you're gonna incubate it or, or you're going to just provide and then where are you to raise the child kind of thing so whether your products a product a service or your idea is a product a service is knowledge based where you can serve and people are interested in what you know um, you know, there's a lot of things there, and we can't go dive into that, but you're here because you're interested in uh, bringing something or starting something or supporting something, right? There is a whole lot of truth in doing what you love. It takes too much blood. It takes too much effort. You can't sustain it if you don't love it. Um, project that forward. Always kind of think in your mind, put yourself a year or two or three from now and go, am I still going to be as passionate about it? Is, I'm, is it that cool of an idea that I can bleed you know, indefinitely for it? And I think um, I, I have, and I'll talk about this later when we get to it, but I call it chasing chickens. Um, as entrepreneurs, you chase chickens. That's a cool idea, that's a shiny object. You, you run after it thinking it's gonna lead somewhere. And I've chased, I can't even count how many chickens in my career. Some other person's good idea, right? And you, you know, I feel like I, I've run, for a lot of my career, I've enabled good ideas um, as well. Cricket wasn't my original idea. We just ran it, we took it. So that, to a degree, I mean, it's a really big chicken, and we grasped, we held, held onto it and ran with it, but um, you gotta be careful of that, because you gotta sustain the idea to reality. Um, there's a few, kind of key reads that I think are pretty much standard in, in the entrepreneurial uh, space. Um, the Lean Startup, who's heard of that? It's referred to a lot. Um, there's some maybe critical review on it, but that doesn't matter. It, it's true. What you're trying to do with Lean Startup is go in pulses to whether the product's relevant or not. Just because you think it's cool doesn't mean it's going to sell. And that's more about the product, the sellability, the, su the sustainability, where the profit margins are. You, you need to go into all of that as you look forward into saying, is this an idea, is it a product, and is it a business? Um, so I would recommend highly Lean Startup as a study manual. I don't know if you've talked about it, Mark, but pivot and persevere, there, there's truth, truth to that. And 
here's the, here's the, um, the pro con of being an entrepreneur. It's easy to tell other, pe other people what to do and then do something different because you are so attached to that idea. Usually when you're done with the project, if you knew what it would take, you probably wouldn't have started. That's, that's a typical thing. When you know how, much it how long it would have taken, how mon much money it would have taken, how much sweat it would have taken, you kind of look back and go, man, I don't know if I should. But the, product or the, the, the result of the ones that succeed, because you're going to have the failures as well, uh, are worth it. And then you see it, and you see people using it, and it's, uh, it's an incredible feeling. Um, think and grow rich, as traditional as that is, there's concepts in that in that, that change the way you think. Uh, I think it's very relevant. Um, written in the 1930s, so they're not even talking about World War II. When they talk about the war in that, they're talking about World War I. Um, anyway, it, it's a good read, definitely. And then there's an interesting book called Pendulum. This isn't one that most people know, but I think it's relevant as the culture of our change. And we go through these phases in our culture every 20 year blocks that we turn it into, um, in, in, who's heard of the book, I'm Okay, You're Okay? An older book, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I need to point that out. Um, that was a kind of a 70, 60, I mean it was like, hey, everything's okay, but it changes into, you know, you're okay, I'm not okay. And we go through these phases that I'm the one that's kind of, you know, struggling and you're the one that's good. And then you go into, you're not okay, I'm not okay. Then you go into, I'm okay, you're not okay. And we're in that phase. We're in that phase that I'm okay, but you're not okay. And the reason that's relevant from a psycho kind of uh, demographic thing is as you think of your product, and you'll learn this in Michael's book, um, that is, if you do a product that stands against something, it's gonna be a stronger reception to the general market just because of that underlying cultural vibe. Uh, stand against something or stand for something but we're in this mode that it's kind of, we're, we're starting to fight. And we're, we're fighting against perception, we're fighting against, you know, you look at the world as a whole, and, and we're back in a fight mode. We're actually back into the 1930s in this pendulum swing, which kind of means some really crazy stuff might start to happen in it, and it is, but not to get into that. That's a good read from a business perspective to think deep. Um, layers of a startup. You know, when you look at a startup and we get into, hey, I have a great idea, how do you fund it? You know, so an, an investor is gonna look at you first. You are your first product. You're your most important brand. If I'm investing in a company, I don't care about the product as, I, as much as I do about that person. I want them to be innovative. I want them to be excited about what they're doing. I want them to think smart. I want them to be intelligent. Then I know they can build something, but their product doesn't mean as much to me as an investor. So in that regard, remember that when you're pitching yourself, you're pitching, or you're pitching your product, it's you first. Um, you're not probably good at everything. I'm kind of that guy that's good at enough stuff to make uh, some commotion, but I'm generally smart enough to realize I'm not gonna try to do it all. And you gotta find your team around you. You gotta find your mastermind group. You gotta outsource to the right people and go, I'm not gonna try to do everybody's job, especially when they do it better than I do. You also need to consider who does the heavy lifting. Anybody a uh, programmer in here? Coder? Designer? What are you guys? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, think of a product that you can do most of the work so you don't have to pay somebody else. That's the basis. Or partner with somebody that does. I have coding partners. I used to code. I hacked stuff together like some of these apps and sold them to make a living. But I'm just a B-rated coder. So I found brilliant coders when we went into the upper realms of the product. So find what you're good at, what you love, what you, what you can lift and do most of the work on, and then find other people that you're not gonna, you know, you might partner with them, you might join a company with them, you gotta be careful about that, but um, definitely find out who's doing the, the heavy lifting. Um, there's two things about the two, two to five percent idea that are more important. The other 95 percent of success is in relationships that you build, who you know, and that they actually like you, that you get the call when they need something, and then distribution. Um, most of my career I've built something but didn't have the distribution stream. So in essence, even with Cricket, ProvoCraft had a massive distribution stream. So I can build something, uh, but I don't have anywhere for it to go. 
So that's one of the things you have to build as you're going through the idea is where is it going to go? And you can't just assume that. People, if I'm going to go to the shelf, like a Joanne or a Michaels or a Walmart, it's extremely complicated. You have to pay for the shelf. They're not going to take any risks with anything. So you have this structure that is a lot, of, it's cost to get in there. And you could lose a lot of money where you think you could gain. But distribution partnerships, that's the beauty about Kickstarter and the internet right now. Social media, that's a distribution channel. If you can figure that out, you can be the one that's heard screaming on a table. You have a distribution channel you control. And subscription plans are cool. You know, knowing that we had $12 billed monthly on about 10,000 subscribers, and then we sold about another $8 or $10 to each one of those, we knew what our monthlies were going to come in. And I built a decent little company, about $2.5 million in sales every year, and it was a great lifestyle business. I made good money. It was not purchasable as it was. And that's something we'll talk about maybe right here. I'll just jump to this. Who watched the Shark Tank? Should be mandatory. There's a lot of truth, as, as dramatized as it is, there's a lot of truth to this. Um, they want to make it spectacular. We get that. But from the mind of the investor, put yourself in an angel's position, um, or in this case, a shark. They want their money back. So why are they going to invest in the lifestyle business? Um, does anybody know the definition of lifestyle versus investable? I get, well, rhetorical. So, right, I, I could not, I'm not, I don't want to invest in just you're making your own income and taking it to your family if I'm going to put money into it. And I'm generally not interested without some level of liquidity event or exit plan in some three to five to seven years, depending upon who you are. So um, they're not looking at good ideas necessarily. They're looking at ways that they can resell a company. And, and any investor needs that. Otherwise, you don't get your money back. And they're looking at ways to make 10x or 20 or 50 or the, the rare 100 times your money. So if I were to put $50,000 in a business and it went to a billion dollar company, yeah, that, that's not a 3% return at the bank. And that's what they're looking for. What you don't see is all the failures that happen along the way. So anyway, there's the difference between whether you're building uh, those either of those companies. And I am going to say, Start it as a lifestyle. Start it as something that you know you can make a little bit of money at, and that there's nothing wrong with that. Make a good living. But we have this, this kind of thing. We have unicorns, and we have, and they're really stupid name for a company valued at a billion dollars or more. People don't start hacking on projects anymore. They become CEOs and start looking for funding. If it doesn't capture the entire market, what's the point of starting it up or showing up? Um, I'm a, I'm a very big advocate because of the way I, I built my company on credit cards. I don't recommend that. Went into a lot of uh, naive, naive uh, mentalities when I started my business. But um, you hear the buzz. You hear the Silicon Valley. You hear the billion dollar idea. You hear that going, right? Facebook and the other ones. It's just that is a billion, one in a billion or one in a million thing. There's nothing wrong with starting a couple million dollar business and loving it. Um, a million, two million, three million dollar business grows. So it could become from a lifestyle to an investable. But kind of think of that. No, in our position here in where we sit, um, we're not in the circles of the people with the big money, to be honest. You know, the ones that can say, I'm going to put five million dollars into this, or I'm going to put 50 or 100. That's Josh James over at Domo. That's his world. Right, raising 125 million, still in a, what's considered a startup, selling Omniture for 1.8 billion dollars. That's a different league, in all honesty, than where we sit right now, and and they don't know who we are. And I say that myself included. And I knock on a lot of doors, but I'm very, with what I'm building now, um, I'm very happy that I'm flying kind of a lone wolf again. My last business, I lost about a 1.5 million dollars. Um, it still hurts. It still hurts. I think that is something that I should be teaching because I went through a whole lot of pain points right here with uh, pitfalls, traps, and trolls. So uh, these are things that you just kind of need to look for. You need to be patient. Partnerships are extremely that, that a lot. Of, a lot of that had to do with a bad partnership that I wasn't uh, willing to let go. When you have a partner, you're married to them. It's a marriage. You're equitably you have a baby. And you have to acknowledge that, or it will fail. 
period. And if they're not on the same page with you and they have your back, um, it's not going to work. Love uh, physics right there. So there's a lot of things in here that you, you need to dive deep. And we won't go into a lot of detail, but you have to think and think and think and think and think. Um, I make, I, I take notebooks full of uh, thoughts and ideas and I write them down and I use all sorts of devices as well. But you, you're your first person to vet everything. And so in that regard, as you think through the business side, get to the right people that can help you, find the right financial advice, find the right, uh, the right engineering device if you're going to do a hard good, or the right software advice if you're thinking of an app something like that, but um, there's a lot of ways you just got to be patient and you got to pay for it at the right time and it will take money unless you're, I guess, an anomaly, but let me kind of see where I'm at. Oh, that's where I was kind of going with that. Um, there's a few and I'll, I'll send these to Mark. Okay, cool. Um, is that 10 minutes or is that moose? Okay. Uh, there, there's a lot of a why or a what. There, there, I'll send some links over if you can send them out. There's an excellent TED talk on, um, just went blank on his name, uh, that talks about that why. And, and really, you got to go backwards from that. There's a lot of products that can be, there can be a lot of what's around a why. So dive into that area. Um, and again, the idea needs to be supported by a why in people's minds. They buy, we buy the why. We don't sustain purchasing of watts. So that's another uh, link that I'll send that's very relevant. Simon yes. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, you've seen that then. Excellent. No, you will now. <laughs> Not yet. Any questions on, on this? Anything up to this point? We're going to open it up a little bit, and I can keep talking about other stuff. So um, I have plenty of material. All right, we'll just talk through. This is an interview uh, with Mark Cuban about kind of what goes on behind the scenes of Shark Tank. And he says, even though there's a deal offer made, you know, they, they kind of reach an agreement. Um, he says about 20% don't go through. They get into due diligence and they just don't go through. So, you know, you, we only see kind of what they edit through there. But um, there's also, in, in, in his world, I mean, he's a savvy investor. He knows what he's getting. So. He actually says in here that about 50% of his deals are, are what he would consider great. Um, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. I think it kind of reflects him and his ability to, to pound into that. But um, the sharks are, are kind of wholesalers as well. You kind of look at these valuations and, you know, Kevin will beat up everybody on the valuation. There's truth to that. But it kind of looks, the, it makes the real angels look bad. They're not as, as kind of brutal as that. Um, but these guys are, are the people that are going to accelerate your business. So they should get everything at wholesale. They probably, they probably get everything at half price when it comes down to it. So in the real world, you don't have to be as afraid of an angel or, or a, a startup uh, investor. But at the same time, um, you know, there's, there's truth to it as well and still, still well um, into that picture. But all right. Um, who's heard of the five F's? as the uh, startup. If you have an idea, it's going to take a little bit of money. And, it, and there's, there's what's considered the five F's, um, which is the first foundational level of getting a little bit of capital to, to start a business. Um, the five F's are the founder. You've got to come up with your own money. You can get um, family. You get fools. And you get former friends. That's the five F's. And there is a whole lot of truth to that. I added a sixth. After going through um, Kickstarter, the, the, the sixth F is frenzy. You can get money through the frenzy um, of Kickstarter. So when you're considering to say, how much money do you need? Do you need a, you know, $500? Do you need $10,000? Um, it doesn't come to life until you have a little bit of money to start that up. If you're, if you're doing all the heavy lifting, great, but you're still going to run into costs. So generally when you're looking for startup cash, it starts with the five or the six F's and the crowd being one of them. That's actually part of that. The, the frenzy is the crowd. Um, I actually put these kind of out of order. SBA and banks and getting stuff from a traditional uh, lender, 
doesn't come in until later. They want to see sales. They want to see what it, what's backing their dollars, products or inventory or something like that. So then you go into angels. Angels are kind of sitting between a venture capitalist and the five Fs. They're the ones that look at a startup in raw form um, and want to be part of something that could be massive because they're going to get in, of course, at even a better level than venture capitalists. And they usually will, uh, angels are looking at a, you know, 20,000 to maybe $2 million investment, um, depending upon what it is and how far that product has come along. And they're looking, of course, for a bigger cut of the company. Uh, venture capital or, or venture capital, and so sharks kind of sit in that range. They're individual, and usually angels are individually, and then they have angel fund groups. If you're a Park City Angels or some like that, then those are a bunch of angels that have a manager. So uh, then it goes to venture capitalists. So venture capital firms like Sorensen, who bought us, are looking at somewhere between two to a hundred million dollar investments, that sort of thing. And generally, they're looking at flipping those over to bigger money institutional money or private equity, which are when you get into Sequoia Capital, if you've heard of some of those that invest into Facebook and Apple and those kind of things. Any questions on, on that? It's kind of one of the key parts, yeah. Um, did I miss one of the Fs because I got founder, family, pool, former friends. And, and frenzy, what's that? Former friends, two of them. Former friends counts as two of them, oh. yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm just calling back your product. Yeah, okay, that's true. There you go. So hard goods is a different story. You need engineering, you need design. It costs more to do a hard good if you want a device. Depends on what that is. Kickstarter is loaded with wallets and belts and keychains and stuff like that that are doing really well. Those are, need to be clever and interesting and fun, and they need to be marketed, but, and they're easy to, to engineer. Um, and you kind of rank them of how much, I guess, money you can make. But Cricket and and Shotbox were, they're, they're obviously kind of children when you get done with them, but Mark was saying, you know, here's our, our product with Cricket, and if you've seen this. This is the very first product that, come out, that came out. Uh, we made it into a consumable with a cartridge that has a bunch of clip art and fonts, which was my background. So my part of this was a lot of the software, the firmware, the interface, and the content. So we figured it out, and a lot of entrepreneurship is figuring it out, because you don't know the answers and nobody's there to tell you, so you, you get the right people around you and figure it out. But we jammed a whole bunch of images on this, and we made a tactile interface instead of a, an LCD or something like that. And, and this was by intent. There's something about the craft industry that you want to get your hands on things. So you take risks, you do a lot of testing, but we absolutely nailed this little plastic thing in a world of digital interfacing. So, um, you know, we created a grid of infinite kind of uh, possibility with programming all the buttons of what they do and that sort of thing. So very, very creative. I can, there was about seven of us. So when you deal with inventorship, I did not develop this on my own. Um, it's a co-inventorship and I take away anything from the other inventors um, that, that held up the different areas of it. But um, this was very expensive to go through a factory in China, of course, uh, or anywhere. Molds and all that kind of uh, costs add up tremendously in the inventory. So that's where that distribution partner and who actually takes on the manufacturing is a, is a massive part of it. Um, Shopbox is a product I've been wanting to do, if you saw the video, for a very long time. By the way, Walt Disney is my hero, so I have this on my desk to remind me. If you've never been to San Francisco, they have the museum, the Walt Disney or Disney Museum. Phenomenal place to go. So spend a day there. But uh, the shop box is a light studio, simple idea, concept that says we are replacing a scanner with one mode. Um, in general, the thought process of this was to look at a solution or look at a problem, which had to do with 12 by 12 scrapbook pages. So my craft industry background was that we never had a way to get past an eight and a half by 11 scan. Um, and, and nothing was ever developed. I kept waiting for something to develop. But the fact that we can't digitize one of the most valuable possessions of, of families that have done scrapbooks is a problem. That, that's a problem. So my angle of attack is solve that problem. Solve the 12 inch wide or the oversized document scanning issue. And if you've scanned, and I have my designer background, I've scanned years away of my life, I hate scanning. And I mentioned that in the video. Um, 
it's technical. You have to have a computer. You have to have all these kind of things. Uh, but we have that. So in our phones, you know, we have a camera that's really good now. So using a camera on any device, but a camera on a smart device with a perfectly lit environment, you end up getting a scanned result. <clears throat> so simple concept, but now my hill to climb is, is getting the mind changed to say, oh, I need it, I want it. <clears throat> the other thing to validate, validate products, by the way, is to go to shows, uh, be, have a table in front of a crowd, pick the show wisely. But uh, we showed up at Roots Tech in February last year, and it was crazy. The family history document, uh, very quick and easy digitization need was apparent. So we go to a show, and we were swamped for three days straight with a shiny new product that, uh, that really resonated with the family history crowd. We're, we're going to be at Comic-Con next week. So we got family history over here, going to Comic-Con for object photography, for anything that goes along with uh, three-dimensional. Yes? Um, the six apps is, is fine in front of the crowd. That's, that's easy enough. And an SBA is not even that difficult to approach. How do you approach the angels, venture capitalists, and the institutions when it comes to purchasing large uh, portions of the company, funding major products and development? Um, it's about relationships again. It goes back to saying who you know and who you're networking with. Um, so you, you should go to those meetups. And, and I can, I'll send out a few links to those kind of things. Angels here 100 deals a day, at least they say they will. They throw most of them away. You're supposed to have a business plan. You're supposed to have all these things that are a stack of documents that they will never read. So you're looking at what they'll attract their attention. And a lot of that has to do with relationships. You build that. They're going to look at the ones that they know the person, or they are recommended from a person they know and trust. So there's a heavy assumption, and in, in, instead of like an SBA is going to look at your plan, the angel is going to look at the person and say, right. "I know, right. I know Aaron. I know how he works. I know what he does. I don't need to look at his plan. Let's give him some money." Right. Okay. Basically, if they, if it's that easy. But they are they're very, the, the 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 more successful they are, the the more they critique. They'll look at they're more savvy too. So that, that's another discussion, actually, <laughs> which could be next time. Hey, Aaron, how many, how many iterations of your talk did you go through? <coughs> About 15, okay. at least. And you tested at least. different customers and you validated them. Right. Like right. Shows, demos, networking events, all of that. We can talk a little bit. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I have so many verticals on this because I don't have a competi competing product yet. So uh, the, the online sellers, Amazon, Etsy, uh, Alibaba. Because I know a lot of that is working for eBay. And those All right. Actually, force certain types of images. Yeah. They want on their, their products. Right. Awesome. Exactly. That's, uh, that'll be a big market for us. So it's the alliances and the relationships I'm forming in each kind of area. Yeah. Good? Thanks, sir. All right. You're welcome. Thank you.